Hello, I'm Graham Fitch and I'm bringing you part two of a video on fingering for Pianist magazine from Steinway Hall in London. Um, I've been in my previous video, I was talking about the fingering that composers give us. Um, and while it's very important to try it out, it's not important that we use that fingering because every human hand is unique. Every human brain is unique. Everybody computes things and figures things out, feels things differently. So all fingering that we see in the score, whether it's by an editor or whether it's by the composer, that it's just suggestion. Um, feel free to change it. I'm going to show you, I'm going to jump in or attempt to jump into one of the, the big war horses of the etude uh, repertoire, the Opus 10 number no. 1 Chopin. I'm going to just show you an example here of a very difficult fingering that Chopin left us. For those of you that with the score, check out bars 32. Now the Chopin fingering is this, big stretches. Five, three, two, one, five, three, two, one. One, two, three, five. Now at full speed and in the context of the piece, that presents a lot of problems. Now I was very fortunate to study with one of uh, Arthur Rubinstein's only two students, he only taught two students regularly, Anne Schein, who I inherited some fantastic fingerings directly from Arthur Rubinstein, and he did not do Chopin's fingering. This is one of the great Chopin players of all time, not doing Chopin's fingerings. He came up with this solution, which is really practical and actually really comfortable, because instead of encouraging a stretched out position, it encourages a closed position. Let me walk you through the fingering. Two, three, one, three, two, three. Now here, let me do that again, see if I can do that a bit better for you. Now change to five, two, one, three, five, two, one, three. Do you see what that does? Let me show you that in slow motion. Instead of having an open hand spanning a tenth, uh, I've got a closed hand that spans only an octave, and then I shift. Now in the next bar, he does this. He, he took the left hand, he, he, he gave the left hand the first note of the, what was supposed to be for the right hand. So the right hand, instead of having that position to deal with, has that position to deal with. It's genius. So. And coming down, shift. And if you notice what I'm doing when I come down, instead of just jumping up like that, I'm able to keep close to my keyboard by just adding a little rotation so if I do that in slow motion, I rotate across so that I feel like I'm connected to my keyboard. Do um, experiment with that. If you play this etude and you get in tangles at that place, try the Rubenstein fingering. We do have it in the magazine. Um, I'm going to move on to another warhorse, which is the Liszt Sonata. Uh, again, check your scores, bar 255. There's a little passage in the left hand that I'll just let me play you at slow motion so you can hear what's going on. Now, the left hand has got semiquavers, 16th notes, throughout. Um, and as you noticed, it's a mixture of black and white notes. What I'm going to do now is to break uh, a supposed rule of piano playing. Some people are really scared about putting the thumbs on black notes in passages like this. But actually, if you look at how the pattern passage is designed, one, two, three, four, it's groups of four fingers. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So I'm perfectly fine putting my thumb on a black key as long as I remember one very important thing, which is when I put a short finger, one and five, on a black key, I have to move upwards and inwards to the back of my keyboard or toward the back of my keyboard. Now out again, in again. So for practice, see how I'm 
basically splitting a, a chord. I could block it out like this and then just roll. It's a very good way of learning it, very good way of practicing it. Now, in, in a fast passage, is it important that we keep the hand, um, use as few thumbs as possible? Sometimes it is, as long as we can keep mobile. If the passage is it, moving in, in one direction or up or down, uh, yes, it's a good plan to use as few thumbs as possible. However, mobility is often more important than that. So if I look at a little snippet from Haydn's C major fantasy, I'm looking at bar 100. I've got here, we've got a little competition. We're in Steinway Hall. There's somebody trying a piano downstairs. I don't think it's going to interfere with what we're doing here. Bar 100, I've got this pattern in the right hand. And it goes on. Now I had somebody bring this for a lesson the other day who was struggling with this passage because he had figured that since this is all one chord position and this is another chord position that he would use the sensible fingering 421542 makes a lot of sense it's it's intuitive trouble was it jammed up his hand and he got paralyzed with this fingering so all we have to do again counterintuitive to move the thumb isn't it but the fingering that I prefer, 4, 2, 1, 5, 3, 1, 4, 2, 1, 5, 3, 1. What that does is it mobilizes my hand. And rather than the motion being excessive, it's not excessive, it's enough to keep me free. So sometimes using thumbs more often enables mobility and keeps us physically free. Before I end, I'm going to show you two beautiful examples from Peter Feuchtwanger, who's a very famous piano teacher here in London who sadly passed away recently. He left a, a great legacy behind, um, including some rather unusual fingerings. Now, if we look at the beginning of Für Elisa, Beethoven's famous Für Elisa, the obvious fingering is, is this, isn't it? In one hand shape. Piece that everybody knows. So five, four, five, four, five, two, four, three, one, obvious, five finger position. Peter's fingering was this. So he did one, two, five, four, five, two, four, one, two, which gives the line beautiful shape, but it also gives fantastic flexibility and mobility in my arm. And I can really control the shape of that much better than that kind of digital sound that Peter was so opposed to. One last one, the revolutionary etude that most people play this way, five, two, one, three, two. Peter's fingering was very different, five, three, one, four, two, three, one, three. Now why? Why did he use the three here and then a four, two, three, one, three? because he wanted a vocal shape. So if one were singing that, the intonation, the color of the E flat, the timing of the E flat. So this fingering enables that to happen naturally. The choice of fingering dictates the shape of the phrase, keeps us really mobile so that we, we do not tighten up. Mobility is the name of the game here. Musical fingering that, that fits the surroundings of, the, of what we, we want to do with the music. I hope that's given you some ideas and I look forward to seeing you soon.